Hi everyone. Today I want to talk about a recent Kino Lorber release, Blu-ray release, um, from just a couple weeks ago. And uh, this is a movie that we have to go back 90 years uh, ago. Uh, it's, it's from 1933 and this is Counselor at Law, starring the great John Barrymore and directed by William Wyler. And it's this, so this is pre-code. The code there is a code in 1933, but it wasn't not stringently applied, and so it's still another year away before that would come to be. And um, it's a, uh, it's based on a play by Elmer Rice, a very very successful play star that starred Paul Muni, and Elmer Rice was also hired to write the screenplay. And it's set in a very busy lawyer's office, uh, a lot of hustle and bustle. Much of it is set in a very large waiting room where we see people coming and going, employees, clients coming to wait. Uh, and they're all, everybody is vividly drawn. Even before they speak, we, seem, we, we can seem to tell what kind of, what kind of people th uh, these characters are. And, um, and it's a lawyer's office. There's two lawyers. One is the staid, staid workmanlike lawyer, one partner. The other partner, played by John Barrymore, is a, a very much a public figure, high profile cases. He has just uh, gotten a woman off on a murder charge. Um, and we don't see him for a while. So this belies the stage, uh, uh, the stage uh, uh, origin of this film because uh, you know, you wonder when is when is Barrymore going to appear? We hear him talked about, and people are waiting for him, and uh, his clients are talking about him, and and then finally he appears. Now on the stage, that would be the moment when the audience would uh, would uh, you know uh, give Barrymore rapturous applause. Uh, and he is a character who has become very successful, but his origin has been as an immigrant, an immigrant son, a Jewish immigrant son. Uh, and he came across on on the boat, and he has he has you know very uh, uh, very strong uh, recollection of what it was like coming over in this boat and, and living in utter poverty. Um, but he is living the American dream. He has become successful as a lawyer. He has he and not only that, he has married a, a rich society woman, is his wife, and he has two two stepchildren by her. And, uh, and so it's very much a story of class, of rising, in, uh, you know, in, in, uh, not just financially, but also society-wise. But it is also a movie in the Depression. 1933 was a dire year in the Depression. So we have, uh, uh, and, and the film does confront that in that, uh, uh, Barry Moore's a lawyer, even though he's successful, he has not quite broken off all his roots to his past, and certainly his mother, his mother is also a character, comes to visit him. This is sort of like a three-act play, so it's on three separate days. One of her, her uh, friends, you know, from the old neighborhood, her, his, her son has gotten uh, into trouble, beaten up by the police uh, for giving a communist speech. Um, so this is a this is an era where capitalism seems to have collapsed. There must be a better way. People are starving on the street. And here is this man who has come from the street, from this poverty, and now living in absolute luxury. So he helps him out, and then he comes to the lawyer's office, and his mother wants him to thank John Barrymore for helping him out, getting him out of jail. But he does, he's, he's not willing to thank him. In fact, he looks at this palatial office and all this fantastic luxury and, and uh, instead berates Barrymore for uh, turning his back and living in this kind of luxury when the people that he came from are starving in the street. Of course, Barrymore defends himself, but then when the communist uh, uh, character leaves, you can see on his face Maybe I have, maybe I have turned my back uh, on, on my past and I've forgotten it. And, um, uh, and there are the injustices in the uh, economic injustices in the world are far more important than, you know, than I can, I, I can ever see again, being that I'm now living in luxury. It's a great, it's a great moment in this film. And it's the kind of moment you would not see 
once the code came, comes into, uh, into play. And because, and also Barrymore's character, he's morally challenged as a lawyer. He'll do whatever it takes to win a case. Uh, he does have a sense of justice, um, but he's willing to circumvent. Uh, he's willing to uh, compromise his, his, the ethics of his profession. So the crux of the story is he may be facing disbarment and everything that he's worked for will, will, uh, will, will collapse. And this is the lawyery part, the lawyer's office and, and, and the... Uh, and the depiction of justice, American uh, justice, uh, is very authentic here because Elmer Rice had a law degree. Many of his plays were, were set uh, with with a law a background of of, uh, of uh, courtrooms and lawyers' office. He was a left winger. He, he was very sympathetic to uh, uh, to communist causes and, and but in general social justice uh, and. <clears throat> So uh, this is William Wyler's first film in which he got recognized. He was a distant relative of Carl Lemley, uh, who ran Universal Studios. Lemley was known for his nepotism, and he really struck gold <laughs> with, uh, with a, a kind of a distant cousin. He started out as a sweeping the sets after the filming was concluded when he was like 19 years old, worked his way up began filming uh, sort of uh, under the radar kind of movies, westerns, but he gets his real real big chance here uh, while he does and he, he makes the most of it because all this is stage play and some of these stage play adaptations of this early talky era are very static. Uh, the camera doesn't move much, they just film the stage play. But while it moves the camera, it's 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 just uh, it, it's just it's mobile. You you follow a character across the room, goes in the door, another character comes out another door, and then we follow him. There's none of the deep focus that Wilder becomes famous for with uh, the uh, uh, director of photography Greg Nolan. But we explore all around. We. we it is a very, very fluid uh, uh, camera moving, always keeps our interest. This is like a little over 80 minutes. I mean, this, this film moves. I, I love these. One of the reasons I love these pre-code movies is they're so short and they can pack so much into one film. So he, Wilder gets very recognized for his, his, uh, his ability to make this stage play uh, cinematic, and, but he also gets a benefit he also uh, uh, gets praised, especially in, in behind the scenes with the studios, uh, because he was able to get such a great performance out of John Barrymore, who was in, he, he had been an alcoholic most of his life, but he was in really bad shape in this period of time. Uh, so he, um, he, he would come to the set hung over, his face was all puffy, they had to put tape over his uh, cheeks. Um, you can see it in the, um, you can see he has the shakes uh, they, when he's sitting at his desk. You know, he's, he's like one hand's holding on to a book, the other hand is doing this on the table. But when he's not doing that, you can see his fingers shaking. And he couldn't remember his lines. And uh, so Wilder employed cue cards all around, the, uh, all around the set to help enhance his performance. And his performance is terrific. I mean, this film plus the following year's uh, 20th century, this is kind of like a, a <laughs> rehearsal for 20th century, which is even more manic and more energetic. And uh, so Barry Moore's talents were still there. Now after that, they would really dissipate throughout the 1930s and he would be relegated to playing in the sort of B movies uh, um, in very small parts, but he was always good. Um, so. And, and Weiler was not, notable for his perfectionism, especially in performance. And actors would, you know, would really uh, battle with him. You know, so many takes. And and uh, but then they would read the reviews after the films came out, and they would read the reviews. And they said that was like, thank you, William Weiler, for getting this this performance out of me because everybody in this film, I, I you know, is very vividly drawn. Um, uh, Elmer Rice wrote some great characters, and Wyler loved the character actors and loved to give them their moment. And it's, it's really, sens it's one of the sensational parts of this movie. There's, there's so many, we move from character to character to character, and everybody is just uh, 
imaginatively drawn and, and, and um, you know, really merits our attention. Uh, I'll just mention some of them. B.B. Daniels plays uh, uh, Barrymore's long-suffering um, secretary who's, who is in love with him, though he can't. He's, too, he's so obsessed with his society wife, he, can't, uh, he doesn't even grasp it. Um, she had been a uh, significant star in, in silent films. We get a very early uh, Melvin Douglas. I think he had been in The, uh, the Old Dark House um, the year before, which was a significant role. Um, very good looking here. He also very soon would become a very big uh, Hollywood star. I have to mention the actress playing the, uh, the switchboard operator in the waiting room, and she's just sensational. She, she adds the comedy to it. She's wisecracking. She has this very high-pitched uh, uh, voice when she's answering the telephone. Uh, she's played by Isabel Jewell in just a, a sensational performance, and she would go on to a very long career uh, playing uh, minor roles in films. Then there is a moment where two directors meet each other years before they become famous directors. Uh, the communist, who I mentioned, is 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 played by um, is played uh, by Vincent Sherman, who would soon uh, direct uh, Betty Davis, Joan Crawford, and, and some of their most significant movies. And the little boy who is playing uh, the stepson of uh, of John Barrymore waiting in the waiting room with his sister. He's about 13 years old, played by Richard Quine, who in the 1950s, uh, Strangers When We Meet, uh, he directed Bell Book and Candle. And there's a great moment where, where uh, Vincent Sherman gets up because he's just so, he's so offended by these spoiled little rich kids and their, their privilege. And he gets up and clenches his fist and looks at them and the two children are terrified. <laughs> um, so, uh, we get we also get a commentary here uh, from Daniel Kremer, and he has a real coup because uh, his guest is William Wyler's um, uh, da uh, daughter, and she had produced in the early 1980s. She had produced a, a documentary on her father, where she was able to cajole him into uh, in, into uh, having a, being interviewed about his career. And as it turned out, it was only a, a couple of weeks before her, her father died. And she's, she's terrific here. Daniel Kremer has a great film knowledge, and he just he sort of goes off on tangents to show us his film knowledge. Uh, I wish he had let, let um, Weiler's daughter talk a bit more. In fact, he never asked her like an elemental question like, what is your favorite film by your father and why? Uh, because she's really good. I mean, she, you know, her insights into the film. Uh, uh, she brings up the point that Paul Muni played the part of uh, of uh, this lawyer, the famous lawyer, on stage, and he, they wanted him for the film, but uh, he didn't want to be typecast. He was Jewish, and he didn't want to be typecast in Jewish roles. But on the other hand, you could hardly tell that this is. Uh, you know, uh, a story of a Jewish immigrant because uh, uh, Weil, uh, uh, Weiler's daughters uh, showed uh, the film to her daughters and her daughters never even picked up on the fact that it was about Jewishness. It could just be about any ethnic group. But Muni turned it down. I don't, I don't know why. <laughs> I, I don't know how he could have possibly turned down this role that he had already played on stage. And Daniel Kremer, too, uh, really emphasizes the Jewish nature of the film. Uh, not one of his greatest commentaries, but you know it, it's definitely worth listening to uh, uh, to hear uh, William Wyler's daughter. And that, and she she points out because this is a 2023. Uh, this is a very very recent uh, uh, commentary. And she points out that that documentary on her father is currently. I didn't check it out, but she says it's currently on YouTube. She left it up there. So she said somebody uploaded it, and uh, I was gonna, I was thinking of taking it down. And I thought, oh, what the heck? Let let the, let the people see it. So I'm gonna I'm gonna check that documentary out later on. So we get uh, I think one of my favorite uh, films from the pre-code era, Counselor at Law. Thanks a lot for everybody who managed to listen. I do appreciate it. Comments are welcome. Take care.